Now, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Georges Tridimas from the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland and Takis Tridimas from King's College in London. Um, and uh, they will talk about the issue of political independence and public awareness. Thank you very much. The, the presentation um, will be made by, by George. Um, this is for several reasons. First, uh, age before beauty, as it were. Uh, secondly, because, we, <laughs> secondly, because uh, our presentation has two parts, the, which is work in progress, and we believe that uh, viewing also the other presentations, in terms of complementarity, we want to um, present a, a, an economic analysis uh, so this is one of the rare occasions where lawyers uh, defer to economists. Uh, I'm going to uh, circulate a paper. I'm afraid we don't have enough copies for everybody, so I would, I would, I would ask you to, to, to share. Thank you. May, first of all, thank you for inviting us. Then uh, uh, thank my brother for reminding me that I am older, probably considerably so. Uh, and uh, on with uh, the paper. So we talk about accountability. I thought that would be quite nice just to see that accountability actually is taken seriously by lots and lots of people, some of them not like me, not commoners. But that's not the point here. The aim of this study is actually twofold. Uh, first of all, we look at the independence of the European Ombudsman and compare that with the European uh, Court of Justice. And we look uh, at uh, what we call the structural independence. In other words, what are the mechanisms which can secure that independence? We look at appointments, we look at jurisdiction, we look at uh, the instruments that the two uh, 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 institutions possess. And the second part is that we examine empirically what factors actually may explain uh, the replies that the uh, uh, EU nationals give to questions regarding the rights, uh, the citizen rights in the EU, the EU administration, and the role and functions of the Ombudsman. So, we, uh, we, I will actually deal uh, with uh, the second part, and uh, we start from the premise that uh, for the uh, Ombudsman to uh, help the EU administration to do what um, it is, has promised to do, to be transparent, to be effective, and uh, uh, friendly to the citizens, uh, citizens must be informed about the EU rights and they must know who to turn to in order to protect such rights. There was a special Euro, uh, Eurobarometer study actually back in 2011 uh, which was commissioned by the Parliament and uh, it, um, uh, it was addressed to a sample of 20, almost 27,000 uh, EU nationals, so it's a very large sample from all 27 member states at the time and that was interviews face to face and uh, uh, it's um, uh, an important actually database uh, uh, which gives us a lot of information regarding uh, attitudes uh, on the issue that I've just mentioned before, uh, uh, and knowledge uh, uh, regarding the role of the uh, Ombudsman. The replies that uh, 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 have been published show actually uh, a significant variation from country to country regarding knowledge about citizen rights and knowledge about the role and the functions of the EO. The summary of the findings is what uh, uh, some of you have got um, in, in front of you. Uh, Please share. If, uh, if I know that's not enough, I'm, I'm afraid. Well, my apologies for that. So let's uh, very quickly look at some of those questions. Well, this is actually the summary that you supposedly have in front of you. I don't know actually how clear it is from, from this side. Uh, uh, so 27 members, a number of questions which uh, we divided into three categories. We'll look at that as we go. So uh, uh, first, uh, there is the question of how informed are the e EU citizens about the Charter of Fundamental Rights? And uh, on the left-hand side, uh, uh, we have fully informed about rights, 14%. That's rather small. I mean, by all absolute measures, that's rather small. And not informed, exactly the opposite. This is a scale of one to four, really, uh, 72%. Uh, the most informed, actually, uh, are the uh, Luxembourg uh, nationals. And the least informed, Latvia, the percentages are over there. Then the next set of questions, how satisfied are the respondents with the EU administration? Three uh, uh, areas there, Effective, uh, uh, effectiveness of um, EU administration, <laughs> service maintenance and transparency. These are the averages, the EU averages. And um, uh, the next uh, question actually uh, the, uh, regards the 
uh, the EO, specifically the EO. So the uh, most important function of the EO is to ensure that EU citizens know their rights and how to use them. Uh, EU average 52%. Uh, there is actually something there. There is the, the Nordic uh, outlier. Uh, after all, the Ombudsman is an institution which started from the Nordic country. So we can see actually the score highest there, uh, 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 seven, almost 70%. Romania is the, the lowest on that account. Now, next question about the EO. How interested uh, are you in uh, being informed about the responsibilities of the EO? That's the EU average, 49%, uh, a little bit less than 50%. Now, Cyprus seems to be the uh, uh, country uh, whose uh, nationals are most interested, and that was before the Cyprus crisis. So we're talking about 2011 here, not 2013. Uh, I think it's just a fluke, really, uh, why Cyprus came up like that. And uh, there is a question of what are the most important citizens' rights according to, uh, the, uh, 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 to the views of the uh, uh, in interviewed people. So uh, free uh, move and free uh, residence in the EU, 48%. We can see actually maximum and minimum uh, from uh, of the, of the EU countries. Good administration by EU, submit complaints to the EO and petition the EP. Uh, for all of them, the, the average is below 50%. So there is the national variation, as we said before. Now, as uh, quantitative analysts, as economists, as statisticians, as soon as we see this kind of quantitative uh, uh, variation, we say, right, how can you explain it? What is going on? Why are some actually countries more interested? Why are the countries less interested? What are they? Uh, explaining uh, uh, factors? What are the determinants of this? So we try actually to... Uh, explain uh, the survey responses to EU rights and the EO. And this is something that quantitatively at least has not been examined before. So we think that this is a, a new area and we are trying actually to, uh, to get some, some information, some understanding. So our statistical analysis is uh, uh, actually uh, takes the following form. We try to we set up an equation, if you like, and on the left-hand side of the equation, we say what is that we are trying to explain, the answers. So what is on the right-hand side? What are the variables which determine the answers that we saw uh, before? As, well, as an economist, I start with the standard uh, answer, level of income, real per capita income. Uh, but why is that? just because economists say so. The reason is primarily the size of the economy means complexity of the economy. Complexity of the economy means likelihood of disputes. Likelihood of disputes, some of them will eventually go into, let, let someone actually uh, get, uh, see what I'm talking about. Let someone actually uh, adjudicate on what I'm talking about. In addition, the higher the level of income, the more informed citizens are. Probably they are more educated, probably they are more exposed to uh, good quality media, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the richer the economy, uh, the, 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 the more informed individuals are supposed to be from that economy. So there is one variable. Second, and most importantly, uh, borrowing from uh, what is the literature on uh, uh, the dynamics of economic and legal integration, uh, we think that the strategic variable here is intra-EU trade. The hypothesis is that the more a country trades with other members of the EU, then the more that that country is affected by EU legislation and administration, the lend, uh, leading, therefore, the citizens to be more familiar with EU matters, uh, uh, leading the citizens to be affected by EU administration, and therefore, uh, eventually, lodging complaints about such matters. So there is actually a well-set theory on that one, the, legal, uh, the dynamics of legal and economic integration, and we borrow from that theory, and we uh, propose this explanatory variable. In addition, we do not want to pick up general attitudes. Oh, well, this is a country which is, in general, pro-EU. This is a country which is Eurosceptic or Europhobe and so on. So in order, actually, to make sure that we do not contaminate what we find by attitudes, we add the variable as explanatory, as an independent variable, the trust that EU citizens show, uh, that, the, the, that the trust that nationals show to the EU in general. This is something that the Eurobarometer actually uh, publishes every year, so we've got plenty of data for that. We simply use the relevant information for 2011. More variables, of course. Uh, the number of years that EU membership uh, of EU membership of each country. We expect that citizens of countries that have actually been members of the EU for a long time, uh, they are more familiar with uh, uh, with uh, EU uh, legislation, procedures, and so on, and therefore uh, they would be more knowledgeable about rights and about the functions of the uh, EO. Uh, next, we look at. Um, uh, understanding that the EU countries have different political uh, and historical backgrounds, we also add another variable, the length of democracy of each country, uh, different political histories, 
probably uh, affect different attitudes towards accountability, democratic accountability at the transnational level. Uh, also, again, in order actually to make sure that uh, uh, we, do not, uh, we do not pick up spurious uh, relationships, we add uh, what is known as domestic governance. And uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, actually con uh, includes four different variables, voice and accountability, uh, uh, government effectiveness, rule of law, and control of corruption, or the definitions, as well as the data, come from the World Bank. It is not something that we construct, it is something that we take. There are actually indices of all those issues, of all those actually attributes that the World Bank uh, uh, publishes every, uh, every year. So we use them up for the relevant year and try in this way to pick up, uh, to actually to uh, 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 decontaminate what we find from spurious relationships. So uh, these are the variables. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the strategy is the following. I'm not going to go into those, uh, into those numbers. Don't, don't worry about that. This is actually, that was frightening when I saw it myself. When it comes out of the computer, you say, what is going on? Uh, what I want to say here is really that, unfortunately, we have a, a small sample. We have a small sample in the following sense. Even though there are about 27,000 27, interviewees, our sample is uh, 27 countries. And uh, 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 27 observations, really, because uh, of, the, of the aggregation. So we cannot use all those explanatory variables in one single equation. Uh, be that as it may, we still have actually plenty of mileage uh, that we can do the econometric exercise. So we, have, we use ordinary least square estimation, that's a standard estimation, I think simplest possible because of the small sum. So this is what OLS stands for. Ordinary least square estimation is it, if you like, is, the, uh, is a sacred tool. We right? uh, don't have to talk about that. And we have actually uh, uh, the, the three tables here. First of all, we look at the determinants of percentage of respondents who uh, are informed about the EU rights, then about the EO. I will look at does actually in some kind of detail, and determinants uh, uh, of the attitudes towards EU rights. So uh, let me go into the results uh, and what exactly we find. In the first instance, we find that as the level of uh, uh, income rises, so does information about citizens' rights. This, this actually accords very nicely with uh, our prior intuition. We also find that an increase in intra-EU uh, trade leads to more information about EU rights. In other words, uh, countries with more income are countries which show uh, uh, bigger uh, uh, knowledge of, uh, the, uh, of the EU rights and higher satisfaction with effectiveness and uh, service of EU administration. Again, we think that these results are actually quite nice. They accord well with our intuition. Uh, we find out that the more citizens trust the EU, the more they are satisfied with EU transparency. Again, that is intuitive, otherwise they would not be doing business. business. The higher importance they place on the right to free movement, uh, uh, the more they trust the EU, the more in other, uh, uh, citizens actually, oops, sorry about that, uh, the more citizens actually are, um, uh, uh, the, the more uh, value they put into the right to free movement, uh, the less they are informed, however, about their rights, which is counterintuitive. But here is something which came as a surprise. Uh, the longer a country has been a member of the EU, the smaller the percentage of those who are informed about the EU rights. What is going on? I think the explanation they come up with some kind of inertia. If I've been living with a system for a long time, I don't know about it. It's there. It's part of the furniture. I don't pay much attention. So it's like some kind of inertia. We also find that the smaller the percentage of those who are satisfied with the EU administration of service and transparency is related to the longer that the country has been a member of the EU. In other words, the longer a country has been in the EU, the more flawed the EU administration is perceived by that country. Now that's an indictment. Now that is something I certainly, a priori grounds, I did not expect. And all that we have before, in a way, contradicts what we find here. But there is the empirical, the empirical statement. This is the empirical result. It is not manufactured. It came out. Uh, uh, next, we find out that the longer experience of democratic government is the, the uh, longer experience is a, uh, of democratic government is associated with higher satisfaction from the effectiveness and transparency of the EU administration, higher importance of the rights to good administration and. Uh, petition uh, 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 the, the e parliament, lower importance of the rights to free move and uh, submit complaints to the EO, lower interest in information about the responsibilities of the EO. Uh, kind of a mixed bag of results here. Now, the higher country score is on voice and accountability. Voice and accountability is really how far the country is judged as a, democra as a democracy, right? How competitive the elections are, how much Freedom is there in elections and, uh, uh, and, and so on. So the, the, the higher country score on voice and accountability, the lower the importance that the EO, the, the, that the EO ensures that citizens know ab uh, uh, about the EU rights, the lower the importance of the right to petition the EP. In other words, 
it seems that if I'm happy with what happens domestically, I don't give actually much attention, I don't pay much attention to what happens transnationally. Um, we also find that the larger the effectiveness of the national government, the higher the importance of the responsibility of the EO to ensure that citizens know the EU rights, the higher the importance of the rights to free movement and petition the EP, the lower the satisfaction with the effectiveness of the EU administration. And the more the rule of law is respected in a country, the fewer citizens are informed about EU rights, the less they are satisfied with the effectiveness of the EU administration, the less they prioritize the right to good administration by the EU. So what we get here is, what we think is happening here is a kind of substitution of domestic rule of law for EU. If citizens, nationals, are actually happy with the way that the domestic uh, uh, political, uh, uh, well, regime in general, politics, law, rule of law, and control of, uh, uh, of corruption, so on, works, then uh, citizens do not turn to the EU to support rights, to try actually and redress possible complaints they have. On the other hand, if a country actually uh, 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 scores less on a domestic uh, application of the rule of law, then those uh, the citizens from that country turn into the EU as a, a way of redressing. And uh, that actually, uh, that's a final result regarding uh, the control of corruption. Citizens of countries that control corruption successfully are less satisfied with the transparency of EU administration. Again, you see this kind of uh, substitution here. And are less interested in information regarding the responsibilities of the EO. So it, we, we get a picture, if you like, here, which is uh, ethnocentric. If what happens nationally is satisfying, then I do not turn to the, uh, to the uh, European uh, 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 organs of transnational governance. Uh, I would like to stay a little bit actually longer, focus a little bit actually longer on uh, the results that we find for the two questions regarding uh, 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 specifically the EO. So we, in the set of questions, uh, uh, we had um, uh, 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 the issue of uh, uh, asking the interviewees, the EO's most important responsibilities is to ensure that citizens know about the EU rights, do you agree, uh, and so on, so a scale of uh, uh, one to four. And second question, citizens, uh, uh, how far citizens are what they call totally informed about the responsibilities of the EO. So looking at those two regression results, we come up with, we, we actually derive the following, actually, we have the following uh, findings, empirical findings. The lower the voice in the accountability score, the larger the percentage of those who agree that the e, uh, EO's responsibility is that citizens know their rights. So the, the lower, actually, that uh, uh, the domestic score of democracy is, uh, the, the more individuals actually think that it is uh, the responsibility of the European Ombudsman uh, that citizens know what their rights are. Again, see that kind of substitution. Uh, so citizens appeal to the European Ombudsman as a substitute for low domestic voice and accountability. The higher the government effectiveness score, the domestic government effectiveness score, the larger the percentage of those that agree that the EO's responsibility is that citizens know about their rights. So we conclude from this that experience of high domestic government effectiveness leads citizens to demand strong transnational governance too. So if the... Um, uh, government effectiveness is high domestically, then I would like to see that repeated at the transnational level. This is what that says. Yeah, which I think again it makes makes very good sense. It is actually a, an intuitive finding. Uh, 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 we also find that the longer a country has been a democracy, the larger the demand for information regarding accountability. Right? Again, that accords well with intuition. Looking specifically at the ombudsman, what we call the economic variables don't work. Uh, the lower the control, oh, sorry, not yet. The lower the control, uh, uh, the lower the control of domestic corruption, the larger the demand for information regarding accountability. Again, citizens try try to compensate by turning to the EU. And finally, as I said, uh, neither economic variable, nor per capita income in real terms, nor intra-EU trade, nor trust in the EU affect the views of the respondents reg regarding the EO. So we hope that in the, on this account we can say it's not really economic. <laughs> It has nothing to do with economics. How citizens view the EO has nothing to do with the size of the economy. Uh, uh, some economists actually may, may complain about it and say, you didn't check this, you didn't check that, and so on. These are actually the, uh, uh, the, the results as we have them. And 
I, as an economist, I was a bit surprised. I, th I thought that the intra-EU trade, uh, well, I, I, I probably I thought that it ought to be there. It is not there. The other issues, uh, governance, uh, uh, democratic tradition, and so on, are important, but not the economic variables. Ooh, I'm doing nicely here. Um, so, conclusions. Well, as far as information issues are concerned, I think from the point of view of economics, it is quite comforting to find out that uh, the theoretical predictions are consistent. Uh, in other words, we find out that uh, the effect of income and of intra-EU trade actually relate positively to uh, the level of uh, 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 information that uh, EU nationals have uh, regarding uh, EU, EU matters. Uh, uh, citizens seem to, be te seem, seem to be tending to the EU, including the EO, only when they consider domestic governance as defective. So that is the other conclusion which we think is very, very important and quite, quite happy actually to discuss and get uh, the views here. Uh, the next is the surprising results. It, um, uh, no matter how many uh, if you like, permutations we tried in the empirical uh, estimation, uh, it always comes up, that result always comes up. Uh, the negative effect of the length of EU membership on uh, uh, attitudes towards actually satisfaction with the EU administration. It's what we called before the uh, indictment. Um, I was trained as an economist as soon as I actually I produced some kind of uh, empirical findings to say something about policy uh, recommendation. So if we can actually get something like a policy recommendation out of it, is that probably the EO, the EO needs to be more proactive uh, to inform uh, at large the EU uh, nationals actually how at this moment she can help them. This is not a politically correct, it is a she can help them. Uh, what exactly it is that the EO can offer. Uh, we hasten to add that these results are preliminary, they are tentative, uh, they call for closer scrutiny. Uh, we would like to uh, uh, play with more observations. That's very, very difficult. You cannot actually change the sample. Uh, we hope that we can start a debate. And I think with that, I can close. Thank you. Thank you. As we said, Thank you very much, George. Half of the paper, right? <laughs> Remember, but we just wanted to concentrate on to focus on that. Like, there is a lot of the political uh, independence of the of the EU, but we decided to concentrate on that because otherwise you would certainly be over the time. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, so, are there questions, observations, um, remarks, comments on the intuitive or counterintuitive findings or methodology? Or yes, please, touch on. Yes, thank you. Uh, I would have uh, just a short uh, comment and a question. Uh, maybe, I don't know, it's kind of counterintuitive for, for me coming from an Eastern European country. The ones that were listed under the, the um, uh, heading that, uh, you know, that they have lowered uh, the use of voice and accountability in their national uh, systems, and thus they are turning to the EU and especially uh, to the European Ombudsman for, for uh, redress, for comfort. Um, so looking at the decisions of the uh, European Ombudsman in the uh, last decade uh, or so, the impression is that maybe this uh, Eurobarometer that are, are sensitive to the perception of the, of the citizens, so they w maybe declaratively are willing to address to the ombudsman are not actually happening in practice because uh, uh, mainly the, the um, petitions are, are coming from the Western uh, democracies. That's my, uh, and, and, and our impression uh, after looking at uh, numerous decisions from the, from the European ombudsman. So uh, this uh, appetite for, for going to the European ombudsman declaratively is is uh, uh, acknowledged, acknowledged by the Eurobarometer, but in, in practice, maybe you you would uh, be willing to, to look in, in practice if it really happens, and that could be also counterintuitive to the findings of the of the of the study. 
they should in fact go to the to European numbers in large in large numbers. Chuck. Yes, um, I would complement uh, what Dragos just said by saying probably what would be needed, but that's difficult if you have numbers of uh, uh, questions from citizens from those countries who do go to the European Ombudsman but are not uh, relevant because it's not in the realm of her. Uh, my observation was that somehow the uh, observation on the length of EU membership uh, correlates with what I know from per personal experience in teaching European law to not to students to to civil servants etc but also something you which you see uh, sometimes it's very difficult in primary uh, references that indeed uh, the level of knowledge of EU law is certainly not uh, equal to the level of length on the contrary you have the same phenomenon that especially in the initial member states, uh, for a very long time there have been periods where they all thought they knew it, whereas uh, with exception, I, I saw it with Spain and Portugal, but also uh, uh, with uh, the 95 and maybe uh, recently, there's an effort to spread information training, which uh, all the member states have not systematically undertaken. So maybe there's something which is then difficult to, to confront because the data would not be accessible in a uh, um, quantitative way. You would have better overview than the Ombudsman Secretary General of the nearly last 20 years, Ian. You have a I just wanted to, to, to make a comment um, on the finding that uh, the, there's a negative correlation between perceptions of effectiveness of domestic governance and willingness to turn to the European Ombudsman. By the way, I'll preface that by saying I found the, the presentation fascinating. Uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's uh, a, remarkable, a remarkably interesting analysis. But on that particular finding, what's slightly disturbing about that, about the implications of that, is of course that the European Ombudsman has no mandate over the domestic governance of the member states. So that uh, the, 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 the fact that citizens are more willing to turn to the Ombudsman when they're dissatisfied with their own gov the governance arrangements in their own member states creates a problem both for them and potentially for the European Ombudsman because there's a mismatch of, of, of expectations and, uh, and competence. But that leads me on to the further thought that, and of course you don't have in here, you don't have data because your Eurobarometer didn't collect the data, is whether the perceptions of the effectiveness of domestic governance include perceptions of the effectiveness of the national ombudsman institution. And it may be that that, that might be, in thinking in terms of policy implications and relating this to the, um, to, to the debates that have gone on previously, that strengthening national ombudsman institutions might be a way of, in, in as part of a network involving both the Committee on Petitions and the European Ombudsman, could be an appropriate policy response in order to, to, to move forward on this. And that reminds me of, of final point, one of the other things that um, uh, was proposed by, by Jakob Söderman to the convention, not to the convention drafting the Charter on Fundamental Rights, but the um, the convention drafting the ill-fated constitution to include the national ombudsman in these in the list of, of, of bodies that EU law mandates to exist and be independent at national level and because at the moment there's nothing there's absolutely nothing uh, in EU law which requires there to be a, a, a national ombudsman equality bodies yes data protection uh, Authorities, yes, um, but not uh, not ombudsman as such. May I add? Do you have any experience with a list of inadmissibility of complaints? Is there any relation to what George was just presenting? Yes, I think that's the, the, indeed. Um, there were lots. Martin, my colleague Marta Hirsch Zimbinska will 
be able to speak about this with more authority than I can. But I think most of the complaints that we got from Poland, for example, in the early years were about um, seizure, expropriation of property under the former communist regime, um, which of course is not something that the European Ombudsman could do anything about. But these were people who had tried everything at the national level and uh, w without, without success. And so they turn in desperation to the European Ombudsman, who unfortunately can't help them either. Just, just add something there. Um, sometimes I think you can overstate the degree to which the European Ombudsman should spend her limited resources on um, uh, making people in Europe, the citizens of Europe, aware that the office exists because I could personally meet every single citizen and hand them a leaflet and uh, you know, indicate where the website is, but the number of those who will actually need the services of the European Ombudsman is actually very limited. Um, and the vast majority of interactions we have with people through the, through the uh, website, um, I think we get something like 22,000 inquiries, you know, whatever, interactions. Most of them relate to issues which we promptly send back to the, to the National Ombudsman. So I think when you're, when you're because you ha it has to be a complaint against the European, a European institution, and not that many citizens have direct interaction with European institutions. So we can try and make, I, I think it can be a false analogy to make in some areas of our work with those of National Ombudsman. So therefore, you know, how, I explained my strategy earlier, well then how do I make best use of, of limited resources, you know, 65 people and limited budget, so on and so forth. And, and that's why I have started to place uh, a particular emphasis on the on initiative investigation so that you're dealing with things at a systemic level and hopefully they will trickle down. And that's the way that the citizens are ultimately helped rather than by the individual complaints, which of course are very important because they can, they can be the, the canary in the mine, if you like. They, they can be the pointers to where issues of, of systemic uh, uh, problems are. But, but I think you could waste an awful lot of energy trying to tell people about you who may, in their entire lives, may never need to know about you. And I think the responsibility for, uh, for apprising people of their rights in relation to, um, uh, to, in relation to the, the chartered treaties and so on, I think that is very properly, uh, particularly the responsibility of national administrations and national governments, very many of whom I think are very weak in relation to, um, uh, to, to, to doing that. Uh, so, I, I, um, I, as I said, I think using, to me, one of the ways in which I am attempting to affect the greater number of citizens is through a particular emphasis on these systemic um, investigations. Mm -hmm. Takis, uh, and, and Takis and or George, uh, to, for, for a few final words. Uh, just very briefly, uh, to, to uh, link with the discussion, the, the other part of what we are doing, which is looking at independence and comparing the independence of the Ombudsman uh, and the European Court of Justice. And there are indices of, of, of judging um, a, a structural independence. Uh, we follow a methodology developed by, uh, by um, political scientists looking, for example, at the remit, the jurisdiction, the method of appointment. Uh, and I, just taking a point that, that Ian mentioned, we, we link it better than what, what the way I'm going to explain it in the, in the paper, uh, or, or at least we hope to. Um, it, it's one of the areas that I have had some experience is the financial ombudsman in the United Kingdom uh, that was very heavily involved in the equitable life affair scandal, which was also the subject of a European Parliament's temporary committee of inquiry, which did, in, 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 did if I may say so, did a sterling job. And it's one of these uh, financial scandals which had uh, interstate elements. Um, and in the, 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 the three conclusions which at least I derived from looking and working with the National Ombudsman are the following. First of all, um, the people's perceptions was that the Ombudsman was, um, had a more receptive ear than the courts. They viewed the Ombudsman not necessarily as an unbiased um, institution, but as one which was disposed a, in a friendly way towards the applicant. I, I thought that was quite an interesting perception. It did not necessarily um, reflect reality. But this is how people perceive. Secondly, in the United Kingdom, 
um, there was really a choice whether to go to complain to a court or to go to, to the Ombudsman, and then one could go to the court after the Ombudsman. Uh, and what we found in the equitable life affair is because of the remit of the uh, uh, financial Ombudsman in the United Kingdom, most of the law of misrepresentation has actually been developed by the Ombudsman, not by the courts. It's quite interesting that there is, in effect, a parallel body of jurisprudence. The third point is, while the scandal was going on, the law changed, and it changed in the following ways. Whilst until, um, I think it was about 1998, um, the Ombudsman had to follow the law, had to apply the law. After 1998, uh, the Ombudsman had a wider remit. It, 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 could take, it had to take account of the law, but not necessarily follow it. And uh, it's quite evident in, in a number of decisions by the Ombudsman that they felt uncomfortable with that flexibility. They felt they, they, they were in a much more secure ground if they were limited by rules, even though that um, limited the, 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 the remit, as it were. And indeed, their independence. We look at this because a, um, one of the indices of independence is what rules can be applied by the institution. Uh, and I thought that was really a counterintuitive finding, that, that the Ombudsman did not welcome greater discretion, uh, but it was really felt more secure in, a, in, a, in, in, in applying in the context of a rule-bound um, procedure. Thank you.